Right. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for this afternoon's panel on the ever-evolving and pioneering world of mixed reality production. I'm Zoe Mutter, editor of British Cinematographer magazine, and I'll be your host for today's session. I'm joined by a fantastic lineup of panelists who'll be sharing um, the lessons they've learnt from working in LED volumes. Um, before we begin, I'd just like to take a, a show of hands for people that have worked on LED stages just out of interest. I can't actually see. <laughs> okay. So we yep. And then before we begin, I'm just going to ask everyone to introduce themselves, share their roles and their connection to shooting on LED stages. So begin with you, Will. Hi, uh, I'm Will Case. Uh, I'm Director of Innovation at Creative Technology. Uh, we build and operate LED volumes uh, and we operate and work in partnership with ARRI on the ARRI CT stage, uh, which is a very large stage um, out in Oxbridge. Hi, I'm James Franklin. I'm the Virtual Production Supervisor at Sky Studios. Uh, we've done two jobs last year on the ARRI stage. One was for a series called The Rising, which comes out this month, so see if you can spot the VP shots. Hope you can't. Um, and then after that, we were lucky enough to have two weeks of testing at the same stage. Yeah, hi. Um, my name's David Bernbach. I'm the David that replaces another David that unfortunately couldn't be here today. Um, my, I'm head of technology for the ARRI Rental Group. Um, but here I am actually in a different role. I've been leading a team that built the mixed reality stage in Berlin, the Dark Bay, where Netflix show um, was there 1899. And that's been already a year ago. And it was a fun time. It was fantastic to be part of this. And yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'll hand over to my fellow Berlin <laughs> I'm Manon Hartzauker. Um, I'm a virtual production producer for Framestore. Um, I worked on the same show. That's why I know David quite well. Um, so we uh, we were, or I was looking after, or helped looking after the content creation for that same production, 1889, um, and I was looking after the um, the volume control or the brain bar, as it's um, as it's called. <laughs> Hi, I'm Rob Payton. I'm a cinematographer, and I've been working extensively in virtual production for the last 18 months. Um, consulting on the ARRI stage and on a couple of other stages worldwide uh, and helping cinematographers make the transition between uh, conventional uh, studio shooting or green screen shooting and working within a virtual environment. Yep. Fantastic, thank you everyone. And I think a good place to start would just be looking at the advantages shooting on an LED volume presents. So James, if you want to get us started with um, oh, gosh. Okay. Uh, <laughs> some, of your, um, some of the advantages from the, yeah, the rising, the opportunities. Um, yeah, I, I guess the advantages can fall into two camps, right? So you've got the creative advantages mm. and you've got the production advantages. I think most people here have probably seen enough YouTube videos to know the, the creative advantages, the, the level of ambition you can reach on a volume. Um, certainly for, for Sky, we can, we can look at scripts now. Instead of tearing out pages, we can leave them in and go, actually, this is, this is achievable, which is important for us because you know, we're up against... You know, no one looks at a budget when they look at our shows. They look mm. at our competitors. They look at Netflix. They look at everybody else, and they say, "Well, they expect a certain level," and that helps us to achieve that. And more importantly, it helps us to attract uh, talents, which is also in short supply. Mm. So we can attract good directors um, and, and, and the rest of the talent, and say, "Look, you know, we're involved in this exciting new technology. How do you feel about using it?" Um, Come, come and be involved. So uh, that's the sort of creative side, I, okay. I guess. Production side, well, I know the exec producers loved knowing the budget up front, and they knew that was pretty much fixed. Yeah. So things like the weather and you know fading light didn't, didn't affect them. Um, all those advantages you get from being in a studio. Um, and, and the big thing I found, certainly on the rising, and this is a bit of a cliche, but I didn't think it was true until I did it, was the collaboration between the, the HODs, the heads of department. Yeah. Um, you really see that, that come to the fore. People can instantly see any changes, and there's this sort of iterative effect where people go, well, what if we just, like the art department was changing things within the screen? And, yeah. and I know that, that people say, oh, you can move a mountain, and but you really can. I mean, mm. it's not as quick as people say it is, but it can, you can change it um, as you go. So. Yeah. Um, so yeah, those are the, those are the main ones, okay. really. 
And, um, and Rob, do you have anything to add from the sustainability side or perhaps on the control it offers as well? Is there any other? Yeah, I mean, it's an interesting technology. The first time I walked onto an LED volume, I'd just seen a lot of YouTube videos and, and listened to a lot of Greg Fraser interviews <laughs> and everybody was using Mandalorian <laughs> as a reference point, and that was where my, my knowledge began. Um, you, what you find very quickly is once you get over that initial trepidation where people say it's going to flicker and that the color rendition is not going to be great and you're going to have moire, and once you put all those things to one side, you suddenly realize it's a very, very creative space to be working in. It's a very creative environment. Um, it's another tool set that we can use. It's not right for, for every type of production. Mm. But to have the ability to have a 12-hour a golden hour, for example, to be able to shoot a scene through, not be rushing, to be able to have complete control over that environment is great. And, and the thing, the takeaway that I took from it after my first experience, is it's a piece of technology that allows us creativity and control at the same time. And those usually don't come in the same package. One seems to be a trade-off against the other. Um, there's lots of specific examples, just very quickly, just being able to work on two focal planes. If, if we've got our lenses programmed into the back wall and we're, we're dealing with foreground, background, all of a sudden, 35 years of learning goes out the window because you suddenly realize you can be working on two focus planes. You know, that's just one example. I mean, there's many, many more, but, but certainly I would say the, the, the takeout is I get more creativity, I can light faster when I'm working within a virtual environment, and I get increased control. Yeah, fantastic. And, and David, I'm not sure if you just want to explore the, um, the benefits over green screen as well, if you have anything to, to add there. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> perhaps something that we, and there's, there's the creative, the, there's the production things, there's obviously also the, the environmental impact yeah. that is still hard to grasp. But in, I know that in Berlin, where there's currently an analysis on CO2 impact shooting and this environment towards on location. And I think it's not finished, but it's like a 50, per, it could be around about 50% of a benefit over just flying a crew around. So there's actually, there is an environmental benefit, although it takes a lot of, still lots of power. It's still power hungry technology. So there's this. On the creative side and on the advantages of a green screen, um, there's two things from my side, I would say. One is the topic final pixel, like you create a final image already in the camera. That's nice. Exactly. Thank you. Thank you. That's that's <laughs> the people who actually deal with it. We, we sell it as a final pixel and it's usually not, but it's closer to that. The whole reflections topic, the whole things that what ends in camera is closer to what you will get afterwards. That's from the producer side. But one thing that is once you're there for the first time in such an environment, what really what, what hit me, and I think also Rob, it's much more immersive experience. If you shoot in a green screen heavy production, and if you have, you know it, it can, can be kind of boring. It can be kind of, you have to, you, your mind is working a lot to make it work. You come into this mixed reality stage and you are there. We had those fantastic ballroom scenes and, and stuff like this on the show and you, you're there, you know, it's, you didn't build it, you just built a foreground, but it's, it's such a different experience, it's a fantastic experience, mm. absolutely. And, then, and Will, what about the cost savings involved? Do you have any other details there? I think, is it cost saving? Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, think it, I think it can be. I, yeah. I think to still Greg Fraser's thing, it's very time efficient. Mm. So I think that is cost saving um, because of the fact you can get a lot more done in the time. I think it's, there are certain things where it's definitely cost saving. There's no doubt about it. I mean, some of the car work we've done, you know, you couldn't be out. We've done shoots out on roads at 11 o'clock at night in the centre of London, shooting for eight hours at 11 o'clock at night with a fight in a car. You know, to even try and do that logistically and the cost associated with that are cost prohibitive or very difficult to achieve. So I think, I think there are cost saving. I think it is more sustainable. It's becoming more sustainable. And I think it's becoming more efficient as we, as we get better at it. Um, but it is definitely very, very time. Right. Time efficient. Yeah. Yeah. I, th I, th I think it's quite hard to save costs in your first series. Yes. Um, <laughs> yes, yes. But a second costs. series. Yeah. 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 Um, you yeah. know, you can reuse assets, they're digital assets, mm. you can modify them, you can age them, or you can make them younger. Yeah. So I think, uh, and as Will quite rightly said, it's time saving. So I think yeah. that then. I mean, if you yeah. go back in, I mean, where it's really time, if you go back in time. Mm. So we've just done something in the 1960s in Beirut. Now, to actually go and try and do that, set up the scene to do that, it was, it was actually incredibly cost-efficient to do mm. it. Again, shooting for eight hours 
uh, I think it was 10 o'clock at night, in one scenario doing a seven-minute piece of dialogue. You know, to actually try and do that in a physical building in Beirut with a, you know, a technocrane or whatever, that would have been really, really expensive and very difficult. But also the, the amount of people needed to be in there. So. Yeah. That leads me on to the next question, actually. When is most appropriate to use an LED volume? So, Manon, I'm not sure if you want to elaborate there on what your experiences have been. Yes, yeah, so for, the, for the larger productions, like a, a TV series or a film, um, mm. I would look at how many times you go back to the same location. Mm. Um, that's one of the sort of tools that, that, yeah, that I would look at. Um, and also the, the, the cinematography, uh, the wides on a on a big LED volume are not as successful as the mids and the close-ups. Mm. Um, so, yeah, that's sort of the things yeah. that I would look and, at. And are there any other examples of when it's not appropriate, when you found it doesn't work? Lots. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think if you're, working in, if, if, if you're working with a director who wants to change a lot of things last minute, right. <laughs> it's not ideal, particularly if you're working with a 3D environment that's been created in advance. I mean, if you, you need more time. And, and it's interesting, you've got to get away from that thought of pre-production, production, post-production. Pre post the whole thing within virtual production merges into one, it's production. Yeah. Mm. And you shift your budget around accordingly. So yeah. you take some of your, what would be traditionally your post-budget and build it into to, to, to building the asset. Mm. But if you've built this, if, if your director is the sort of director who'll walk into a studio and say, I know I wanted to do it like that, but let's shoot it in the car park, mm. that maybe isn't the best person to be working with in an LED volume. Mm. Because you know it, it requires a certain amount of planning. And um, there's a director, um, working with at the moment who's done a lot of the Ozark series and he can tell me what camera angles he's going to be shooting on June the 24th on one scene and he's he's perfect for that environment yeah you can plan for and, it. and what about working with um, fragile elements like the screens is there anything that needs to be taken into account there the screens belong the ones we have Mr. Case has put in no so he's probably more sensitive yeah, that's yeah. No explosions no explosions <laughs> Uh, we've had some <laughs> small pyros and stuff. Oh, okay, so you can still. Uh, you can do that. We just can't use oil-based stuff is a bit of a nightmare. Yeah. Um, throwing hard objects at it isn't particularly good. <laughs> um, but, I mean, it's generally it's pretty good. It holds up to an awful lot. Um, I mean, that shoot we did for The Rising, we had things firing at it, didn't we? Yeah, lots of mud. Lots of mud um, and stuff. Yeah. I thought that was a good example yeah. of a shoot. Yeah, yeah. We, we couldn't do any other way, which is why we, we, we did it. Yeah. Um, it was mm. too dangerous to put the, the, the actress on a bike. Mm. And the director wanted close-ups of her face um, so we couldn't use a stunt double so we did it at the Ari stage on a on a Bickers rig and it looked fantastic yeah it looked really good there's um, an interesting part of mixed reality production is the cross-section of different um, talent so you've got <laughs> gaming film entertainment so I just wonder from your experiences what um, what lessons they've learned from each other and why that is such a, a successful mixture of skill sets well, I think it's it you've got gaming you've got um, events and you've got traditional cinematography mm. and they've tr very different skill sets so they could uh, become a real clash what you hope you achieve is an alloy of these skills and if I can learn 5% of what the guys are doing in Unreal mm. then that's all that I need to know and if they can learn 5% of what how a lens behaves at a certain focal length or what a certain light the effect a certain light has they can then build that into Unreal so I think it's just acknowledging the differences and just finding some overlap in those skill sets. And I'm, I mean, um, David and, and Manon probably, it's also creating new roles, which is interesting. Yeah, yeah so our team, our team was, um, it was a very mixed bag. And I, I really put a lot of effort in hiring mixed skills. Um, so we had gaming, we had VFX, we had uh, motion capture. Um, we were looking after the, the tracking of the camera as well on the stage. Um, our motion capture TD was working very closely with the camera department because there was like a, a crown on the camera that got bumped all the time and you have to recalibrate and all, and all that technical fun stuff. Um, so yeah, and we, we sort of took like the first uh, couple weeks because we were also working in a pandemic. So we had to like sort of start off all remotes um, and then we flew everyone in. <laughs> and then um, uh, and then the glue, glued the team together with all those different skill sets and everyone was um, also a little bit selected but um, selected by their proactiveness and like the, the, the hunger to learn really. Um, Any on set team as in like all the other departments, camera, um, director, IDs, everyone was very open to learn from each other um, and we also, yeah, production designer was very important in that as well. Just had it all cross 
glued together when we were on set, basically. Both arms yeah, it's worth saying. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. I think that just, just catching on this, I think it was <clears throat> the, the for us the biggest challenge is really to bring those worlds together because it's, it's a, a world that barrier. it's a language it's and it's not English. It's it's like the, the way you talk. I mean, yeah. it's the way because you bring suddenly people from the post who are not who have a diff, completely different workflow and a different way of working into like this real time workflow with all the other departments that have not worked with those people hand in hand. And that's a big challenge in the beginning, especially on more complex work. And it comes down to just really get to know each other, work together, have enough time in the beginning to, to make it smooth. And then if it's smooth, I mean, you've achieved so much in such time, it's incredible. But I guess it's, it's a heavy... Yeah, a little bit of heavy lifting. Yeah. But, um, yeah, no, it was successful. Yeah, because it's good. Collaboration is key, yes. like it is on a traditional shoot. And there's lots of new roles emerging. Yes. So I know, Will, you mentioned there's up to eight. Your yeah, I mean, I think, just off exactly that. that, I think, you know, when you get to a shoot, the shoot, I, I for my sins, work as a virtual person supervisor sometimes. Um, I don't know how I'm actually very good at it, but I've ended <laughs> up doing it. And every, I think, we've done possibly, I think, now 10 shoots, 10, 11 shoots. Mm -hmm. Every single shoot is different. Every single DOP is different. Every director is different. Everyone's got a different team coming in. and every, So everyone's got very different expectations. And I think it is all about collaboration, but you're also then having to take people, as you just say, from, let's say, maybe a gaming background, and then take them into a film environment where there's a hierarchy of how things work or how things think. So it's a huge learning for everybody involved. And, and one of the things that we've really tried to work out is, is that collaboration and how everybody has to work together. You, you, you have to park egos at the door. You have to all work with each other because it is an evolving, bleeding edge. I mean, the technology itself is we're working with technology that we've pulled in from different places, from live event, a gaming engine, tracking from broadcast, and then trying to stick this thing together that we all expect it's just going to work for 24 hours a day. Yeah. So it's a, <laughs> that in itself well, is a challenge. Is that, and people don't always... I think most people know what people in the film industry do. You know, people mm. know what a DOP does and yeah. director does. They don't necessarily know what the person does you know, on the brain bar, or the people on the brain bar. And that can be a problem because it's a very sort of enclosed space. So a good example is a director or a first AD rather won't complain if uh, a DOP spends 10 minutes changing a lens. But if the if Unreal goes down and they need to reboot, <laughs> then tempers can... And I think that's just about educating as to what mm. that world does and, and the difficulties they're facing. Yeah. Actually, could you run through what, what your role in, involves and then some of the other key people that might be new to um, people that haven't shot on the virtual Yeah, um, well? I call myself a virtual production supervisor, but I'm not the sort of virtual production supervisor that sort of goes on stage. We don't have a stage, so we use other people's stage. So my role is mostly going through a lot of scripts, figuring out, advising in-house uh, drama, what will and won't work. Um, but we also do a lot of... Um, because virtual production is much wider than just the LED screens, obviously. It's the whole digital asset workflow. So we, we work with young screenwriters. Um, we're working with Box Tricks at the moment, which is a theatre production company mm. based up in Manchester. Yeah. Work with uh, new talent up there. And we can you know, quite cheaply and quickly turn their scripts into uh, something in the game engine that people can see. And we, we call it sort of pitch viz, I guess. Um, so rather than sending off a script to a commissioning editor, they can see a short trailer of that, of that work. And of course, that doesn't end there because those assets, if, if successful, can then go into an LED volume. Or from an LED volume, they can then go into an app or they can go, um, or you can gamify it or you can use it for marketing. Or So the whole asset pipeline is of interest to us. And you know, we have um, uh, Glass TV out now, so we're looking at how we might use those assets mm. to gamify it in that as well. Yeah. And then are there are like virtual gaffers, virtual art department. Are there any other people that you'd you'd like to mention that are involved I mean, in that? The other, I mean, from a tech side, mm. I think that is, as you just said at the beginning, you know, we, we started when we built that first volume and we, and we did it. We we thought we needed three people to run it. I think we're at eight. You know, and when you're in shoot mode, you know, people don't realise you've got an LED technician. Yeah. Now, there aren't many LED techs out there who are of that kind of quality. So they suddenly added in all these roles that we're all learning and suddenly are doing a shoot and going, oh, we didn't have that person, we better... And it's like the virtual gaffer. Yeah. That has suddenly become something that has really appeared over the last couple of months, it seems. It, it's sort of always been there because actually someone who's operating a brain bar is not necessarily a lighting person. Mm. 
Now, at the moment, they, they're being asked to because they're being asked to alter things within, within the set, but actually that's not what they do. <laughs> they're not a lighting specialist and they're, and they're talking to the gaffer about it. And they, of course, there's a massive skills gap between those two uh, people. So I think we're all learning and then finding out where those roles need to fit. And then you've got to find the people who to, to fit them. Mm -hmm. And the reality is that that's not something that exists. So you've got to train people. Really. That's very much the same. I mean, when we first started shooting, we thought we needed one Unreal Engine to deal with the background, and then you suddenly realised you were asking the same guy to move a chair yeah. as to move something else, and, and then can you move that light, and by the way, can the sun go there, and can that shadow be a bit, little bit lighter, and then also can you move that, and then you said, no, no, there needs to be a dedicated, the equivalent of a standby props, but who's working on Unreal Engine, who's moving your elements around. You need someone else who's, who's working with lighting. You need someone else who's just integrates. So these roles become creative. But, and I think the key word there is integration. And that sort of leads me on to sort of thinking about e equipment. You know, there, there are traditional pieces of equipment, and I don't like to use the word traditional because it makes it sound old fashioned, but there are pieces of equipment and pieces of technology that work very well together within a volume. And you know, that's what's exciting from a DOP's point of view is when we start to talk about pixel mapping or integrating conventional fixtures, RGBW fixtures, in integrating sky panels and orbiters. Because the one thing an LED volume won't give you, it will give you harsh light, but it won't give you hard light. And that's something you're always going to be searching for, is to have a hard light source. And if you've got a modular stage like the stage that, that Will and the team built at, at, at the ARRI stage, we're able to pull panels out, replace those panels with orbiters you know, at, at any given point on the screen. I mean, there's been some pictures up behind, I think you, you might have seen this, sort of this ring of fire of orbiters. Well, they're pixel mapped in, so they will chase and follow exactly what action is happening on the screen. So the DOP or you know, me or whoever, whichever DOP we're bringing onto the set has got that reassurance that he's got correct color and correct, correct color balance but also has the benefit of the immersive lighting from the LED. Yeah, I mean, I know most of most of people haven't been in such stages, so it sounds very scary, I guess. No, it's weird. It's such a, it's just for the real nerds to do this. So I think that's, don't be scared. What we, we've, we've done, we've been through, and yes, it's complicated, but the thing is, it's, it's a, I think it's an emerging tool and beyond the hype that is now like everybody builds those things, um, it can be an extremely powerful tool in a normal sh environment. It can be the next green screen. It can be a really, really powerful thing. What we're working on right now is to make this more accessible, to make it uh, all of us here go through this and understand what does it have to become to be an everyday tool. I think nobody thinks much about green screening anymore or in the 1950s, back projection that was okay, that you know, know how to do it. It was still a complex technology, and I believe that it will become something more accessible. Right now, and also the question about the money, how, is it efficient now? I would wait for a few years to find out, <laughs> because <laughs> right now it's, it's still very expensive. It's very expensive because look at all the roles, they all want to get paid. But it will become better, and everybody does their thing. We do it on our pieces of technology in our cameras and the lights and in the networking in between we try to make it more accessible easier to use and you have the workflows that get better we have the people more experienced and it can be a fun thing not for everything and not for every shoot and not for 100 percent in every shoot but it's just another tool because yeah, i think another key difference would be quite good to explore is that the post is moved into pre-production so if you could just um, elaborate on that and what is involved in, say, asset creation, how much time you need to, to allocate for that. So, oh, should I yeah, yeah, if you want to take that one. Um, so, basically, when we say, oh, post has moved into pre-production, um, it's more that uh, the, the asset creation that you would have in VFX, you do that upfront. You do your uh, creative sessions uh, with the DOPs, with the production designers, with the directors. Um, you walk the sets that you build in um, in 3D. Um, you set some cameras so you can actually start lighting the, the CG scenes and actually get a feel of like, okay, how how is this going to be shot and actually prep for for the shoot. Um, so there's a whole visualization piece, which is also a virtual production because you're using sort of 
the same tools. Um, that is in the beginning, um, and that just has changed slightly the creative process because it's not linear anymore. Like it goes back and it goes back, and it's iterative. Um, so yeah, and that that just pulls like through the whole through the whole process now. You use the most important word, which is iterative. Yeah. Um, and I think that's where this is such a um, this is the new learning we're all having to get. Is it, it is a, a backwards and forwards relationship yeah. and, and, and it, it has to work that way to get the best out of it and, and you know yeah and the right people in those sessions as well I've yeah. been in sessions where I was with the, the production designer DOP and and director and they were looking at one scene and they had to um, they had to build um, a physical set piece and and DOP was like oh I want to have this shot but in that design you couldn't do that because there was no there was no hole <laughs> there was no 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 window so um, so having like the whole set built in 3D and having those sessions we actually saved the set builders a lot of money because if they would have built it in in real life and had to change it they just yeah they just spent a lot of money on building it basically yeah. so um, yeah so those sort of sessions are quite um, interesting and and quite valuable so in that in that sense you can say yeah it's time efficient but also it could save some money mm -hmm. um but yeah i totally agree with you like it's it's shifting money at the, yeah. at, at the moment but yeah it will get better well, i think rob when we were chatting earlier you were mentioning about the time involved and just being realistic about that depending on the types of assets um, yeah i mean created. when you think about fuel for the wall as i call it at its most basic form it can be a, a 2D photograph, it can be a stitch of a photograph. You know, then you can go take that into Unreal and just animate it if you want a couple of elements. Now, then you move from there into plate work, where there's a lot of plate work being done at the moment. Um, then we go into what we call 2 and 2.5D, two and where you're maybe LIDAR scanning a location, photograph, doing photogrammetry of a location because you don't have access to it, they won't let you in the time you want to film. You go in and you LiDAR scan, then you remap that into Unreal, and the, the, you know that's kind of three semi 3D, um, depending powerful. on. It's very, it's, it's very powerful and it's very cost effective and time effective if you compare that with creating a full 3D asset, and then you get into a completely full 3D asset. But virtually every job I did initially within virtual production, the shoot got pushed because people were unrealistic about their time scale for preparing that asset up front. I mean, every shoot, actually, in, in the first three or four shoots, every single one got moved. You've got to be very realistic about the time scale for preparing, and you've got to be very realistic about the, the amount of testing that's needed. Yeah. And data. The amount of data. You've suddenly got oh, yeah. digital data that didn't exist there before, so you could be turning up a day before where you might have 200 gigs of content that you need to then sync across 11 to 12 machines at once to all play at once. Now that, that bit people forget about. So they make something and give it over and think, oh great, we'll shoot tomorrow. And you're like, well, well hang on. <laughs> it's not quite gonna happen. <laughs> so it's all these things. But that, did it? <laughs> um, but, but I think the, um, <laughs> I think it's just about, again, it's learning, it's education. It, it, it's trying to go on the journey together and everybody understanding how these all roles work. And so that actually when you do shoot, just like a, a normal shoot, you shoot. You know, there's nothing worse than being in a shoot and you're not filming. So the more pre-production there is in that, and the more collaboration there is, and all that kind of, the better it is, because then everyone knows what's going to happen. Yeah, I mean, it's not just rocking up to a location. No. It's yeah. not that. Like, it's really being part of the process. Um, so, yeah. We've mm. been and are there any but, but that said, very quickly, just it's not like rocking up to locations. location. There's two different types of DPs working on these sets. There's There's the Luddites like me, who I go in and I treat it as a location, and I'll walk in and I'll look at the I'd look at the asset that I've got to work with and say, okay, let's pretend this is a location. Where do I need to beautify the lighting? How do I need to change this? Which are going to be the best angles to work with? There are other people who are like the Victorian photographers and they have a hood over their head and they with a grasp with their monitor and they're looking at the, the waveform for everything. There's no right or wrong way to do it, but, there's, but, but I, I always recommend when a DP walks in and sees their asset for the first time to say, what if I turned up on location and saw this? You know, where are the banana skins in this asset? Where, where do I need to, where have I got contrast issues? What do I need to fill in? What beauty lighting do I need to add to it? Because we're, we're here it's talking about virtual, right? yeah, but we're yeah. here talking about virtual reality, but 99% of what we're talking about, particularly when we're, we're filming, is mixed reality. 
and it's it's the integration of those two worlds and and you know virtual reality yes but generally and probably for most of the people in the in the room they're involved in mixed reality and and are there any, any challenges being faced currently that might be solved by solutions that are on the horizon? So I know um, Unreal Engine 5 was released this week. How will that impact um, mixed reality production? Um, James, if you want to take that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I think Unreal solutions? Engine 5 at the moment is more of a thorn in everybody's side. Than, I mean, it's an amazing, don't get me wrong, it's like we're all really excited about it. But I think people are looking at the quality of that and going, we need that now. It's not optimised yet for to be on a volume. I think it'd, it'd be foolish to try. Um, fine for testing, sure. Um, but yeah, it's, it's not... I, I think one, one of the things to, to mention, actually, is things look a lot different through a lens. This is probably obvious, but when you look at something, you know, you may have seen things from Unreal um, on, a, on a TV screen or whatever, and you think, well, it looks a bit gamey, or it's not quite real. As soon as you look through a lens, it's amazing how... Mm -hmm how good it looks. Um, that was one thing I, I learned. The other thing I learned was um, one of the big bottlenecks we have is signing off for that reason, because as soon as the director looks through the lens or the DP looks through the lens, it's like, oh, that wasn't how I imagined it. And there's a lot of time wasted. That could be solved by having an offline stage. Um, it can't be solved just by sitting at a computer terminal and, and looking at it that way. So there needs to be a way of signing off looking through the lenses that you're, you're using. Yeah. I know we're running yeah. tight on time at the moment, so I just thought it would be a good way to round up is just that the key questions um, cinematographers are asking when they're on set. Um, for example, it might be how you match the, match the background and foreground elements or which lens and filter selection, just from your experience on the ARRI stage or um, what and you've encountered. The question comes up about spherical or anamorphic, and yeah. is there a preference for shooting spherical or anamorphic on there? That's one that comes up. Um, Moire is the ever present issue, which is the best sensor to shoot on, you know, what, so there are similar questions, how fast can I run my camera, I want to be able to run it faster, what frame rate can I shoot at, and if you're in a 3D environment, which is the best tracking system for any given, for any given set, so. What are the answers to all those? <laughs> what ah, we well, we've used? definitely run over time. Yeah, I know. Yeah. <laughs> okay, <laughs> we'll not tell you. No. <laughs> but, speak, we don't know. Speak Obviously. afterwards. No. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, it's, it's a bit of a tricky one because it's, it's all, you can see that it's all still very technical questions. We have to come overcome this actually eventually. And that's actually what we're working on right now is just to make, you said, more, okay, lens. We do lens design that is especially lens customization, especially to work in those environments. We do color calibrations that exactly manage that you can see the picture on the screen that looks good. It looks still might look weird and to the human eye, but it looks good on screen. We try to make integrations of all the different little bits and pieces so that you guys can actually shoot. And I think that's hopefully addresses rate, those right? questions. Right. High frame rate, we would love, yes. <laughs> Unfortunately, that's also a tricky thing, yeah. Sync, but we, we've terrible. Stopped. It's a very big computer. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I mean, we, we've stopped. It's not telling people, but we, we've, we, when we first started, we, we were very much sort of giving people direction on what they can and can't do. And I think through the journey now, we, we don't. We stand back and say, right, what do you want to do with it? And the yeah. technology's moved on even that in a year, which makes it so much more liberating and creative because we're allowing DOPs and directors to come in and say, well, what do you want to do with this? And whereas before, you're kind of, oh, you don't want to do that because you might get some worry, or oh, you don't want to do that. But actually, it's moving so fast and everything's moving at such a pace and we're learning so much that actually now we, we kind of let people come into our volume and just have a play, set up how they want to do it, which is really refreshing and a really nice, you know, it's a real move on from where we were a year ago. Yeah. So, yeah. And, and just to round up, if anyone has a key piece of advice, quite quite succinct, because I can see we have run out of time already. But I think David had the best piece of advice. Yeah. Have fun with it. Don't yeah, be intimidated. Yeah, I was intimidated because I read so much about it. Yeah. And when I got to the stage, I just realised you're shooting in camera. You're shooting yeah. in camera, and it's what you see is what you get. I think it's really <clears throat> you need good technology. You need a good stage, but it doesn't mean that you do good stuff. You have to. It, take it as a tool that you have to master. Take it as a tool. And how do you master the tool? Not by playing around with it. It's by doing a job. And what you guys did in Berlin, for example, was a great example. The stage was built and they just shot an, a series, like a, not a test, but a series. And what you learn from this, you, you lose the idea of playing with technology. You take it as a tool. And this is what you need to do.
Don't be afraid. Let's just there's just no do it. experts. There's yeah. no. I would say that there's no experts yet. This technology is so new, and if someone approaches you and tells you they're an expert, be immediately suspicious because the <laughs> yeah. when things are, the learning curve is like this, yes. and then yes. the other takeaway I it would say is yes. test, test, test. That's test, what makes it fun. Test, test. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And preparation is key. Preparation is key. Yes. <laughs> right. Thank you very much, everyone.